Always. We ask the questions. What is the question world? Britanski dokumentarista više struko nagrađivan za režiju, scenarij, produkciju i kinematografiju. Snimio je više od 250 filmova koji su prikazivani u kinima, na televizijama i digitalnim platformama širom svijeta. Autor je i četiri historijske knjige, te redovan član žirija za dodjelu nagrada Emmy, BAFTA, Grierson, One World, ali i ovogodišnjeg AGB doka. Njegov film Moje djetinstvo, moja zemlja, 20 godina u Afganistanu osvojio je televizijsku nagradu BAFTA za najbolji dokumentarac 2022. Phil Grabski za Al Jazeera govori o međunarodnoj intervenciji u Afganistanu i nedovoljnom znanju na zapadu o ljudima koji tamo žive, te o značaju dokumentarnog filma za prevaziloženje različitosti i predracuda. Phil, we didn't manage to do this interview during AJB Dog Film Festival while, while you were here in Sarajevo, but that obviously didn't stop us, so I welcome you to Al Jazeera Balkans program. Thank you very much. Uh, your film, My Childhood, My Country, 20 Years in Afghanistan, has just been released in the UK and the States. <clears throat> what is the feedback so far? In the United Kingdom, it's been very strong. It's a slightly unusual release pattern for us because we didn't intend the film to be completed uh, at the same time as the Taliban retook power. Uh, where we got to was we were going to complete our film on the 20th anniversary of the Western intervention. And it just so happened that the two things happened at the same time. 20 years anniversary occurred just when the Taliban retook power in August of last year. And so Whereas normally you release a film to the cinemas first and then to television, all of our television stations wanted to release the film straight away. So this is unusual that the cinema comes after television. Um, but what we've done is we've, we've done an update of what's happened to our central characters in the, in the past year. Uh, and then also uh, I, I, there's a, we filmed a question and answer session, which we put at the end of the film. Um, the reaction to the film, those that have seen it, either the film before the update or now with the update, is extremely powerful. And that's it's it's testament, partly, I guess, to, to two filmmakers and our team following a, a story for 20 years, which is very unusual, of course. Um, but it's it's more a testament to the remarkable resilience and optimism, despite everything, uh, an endurance of Mia and when, once he gets married to his wife, Shukriya. But what was your motivation? What drove you to, to film this story? Since, you know, when you just started off, you didn't know what the story would be or whether there would be a story at all. Yeah, absolutely. I think the job of a documentary filmmaker is to inform and it obviously helps to entertain at the same time. Um, 20 odd years ago, filmmakers were very fortunate because the technology began to change very rapidly. And one of the, the, the um, technologies that was changing was cameras. Cameras became smaller, very high quality, but it made, it made my life as a filmmaker and somebody that actually films, I, I, I do the cinematography often on my films, it made my life easier. Before that, I might have to travel with a crew of four or five. It might be shooting on film or very heavy video cameras. Um, and that did impede the, kind, the kinds of productions that we were doing. At the same time, and we're talking 2001, I'm afraid that television in my country and, and in Europe and in the United States was starting to move in a direction of an over-reliance on entertainment. And the types of films I like to make, social documentaries, arts films, classical music films, I'm afraid were rather low on their priorities. So basically, um, once the uh, Taliban had fallen in 2001, I, I, I just wondered to myself, who are the Afghan people? We keep hearing about the kind of the geopolitical and the importance of Afghanistan in the world's politics and this, the hunt for Osama bin Laden. And occasionally there would be reference to two million Afghans killed in the previous 20 years. 
If you stop and think, two million? That's horrendous. Who are they? They can't all be uh, women behind burkas who are mute, who you never hear, or men who are bearded. They can't all be terrorists, you know, or muhajadeen. And I thought, I'll, I'll go and find out for myself. But still, what were, what were the risks of filming in Afghanistan? Well, when I first flew into Kabul, so early in 2002, and I was the first filmmaker, the best of my knowledge, the first filmmaker to fly in, um, it was a remarkable vision. You land in Kabul airport and it was a wreck. Jumbo jet, you know, not jumbos, but commercial airliners, all sorts of planes upside down in bits, in half. The control tower was covered in bullet holes. I mean, the town, there wasn't a building that wasn't damaged in some way or partially or entirely destroyed. But also as a filmmaker, I thought filming, making a film in Kabul is too obvious. So I decided to go to the, the next best known Afghan city, in my opinion, which was Bamiyan, because Bamiyan had been in the news because of the two stone statues, the tallest stone statues in the world, apparently, that had been destroyed needlessly, wanton, wantonly by the Taliban. And I also knew that alongside the, the where those statues were, which they were carved into the side of a cliff, there were 200 caves full of refugees, internally displaced Afghan refugees. And I decided to go and try and find a story there. Now, as a filmmaker, I thought I would be finding a central character that was a male. I did think it, I would struggle to find a female that would be a central character. And it never occurred to me to look for a child. But very quickly, I discovered a number of things. One, that I could film. I wasn't going to be arrested. Things had changed. As long as the local warlord gave me the green light, which he did, I was fine. Two, people were extraordinarily hospitable. Three, they wanted to talk and talk about their experiences, which had been awful for many of them. But they still told their stories with humour and grace. Um, but there was no story because everyone was unemployed, exhausted, depressed, Day three, to cut a long story short, I made the best decision I think I've made in 250 films, which was I, Mir and I kind of found each other and I decided he's my central character. If you focus on a child, my audience will, one, they'll be more entertained because kids get up to all sorts of adventures, and he did. And two, you'll start to think about the future of Afghanistan. Where is Afghanistan going? Is all this intervention, money, soldiers... Uh, is it going to make a difference? And it was absolutely the right decision. You mentioned the airport. How did you feel or what did you think when you saw the image of desperate Afghans at the airport in 2021 fleeing out of their country? Well, one of the things that you always try to do with a film is to remind people that we are all the same. I think there's a real problem that people have sometimes, which is they, they kind of discount the other. They think, well, that's just how life is in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, even the, you know, even Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia and Croatia in the past. And what I try to do in my films is make it really clear is that those people who were desperately trying to get out of Kabul airport are no different to me my family, my neighbours, my friends. Um, and so it was horrendous. And what made it worse is it really didn't need to be like that. We do have a lot of human stories and, and a lot of testimonies. And you do a lot of interviews while filming the documentary. But, you know, it, it can be challenging because the truth is never simple. We have objective truths. And then again, we have these emotional truths. How are you able to convey the fullness of a person's experience without hurting the truth or that person? Uh, so, I mean, that's a very good question. And, you know, there was a, a transition through the 20 years. When I went, I went on my own as a Western filmmaker who knew nothing about Afghanistan. So my job really is to ask questions and to not have preconceived ideas. For example, I thought that Afghan men did not want their girls to go to school I just assumed it that's what we would that's what I'd been told that's what I'd read and when you turn up you realize actually it's more complicated than that um, actually Af many Afghan men do want their daughters to be educated full stop 
some are uneasy when the daughters reach a teenage their teenage years and at that point they don't want their daughters to be taught by male teachers uh, so one of the things we did for example is we funded some some female teachers over the years and then that wasn't such an issue one of the things i tried to put across in this film is that there are no blacks and whites in no nothing black and white in afghanistan it's all shades of gray and you have to be very careful not to have these preconceived ideas what i'm doing is i'm going and my job is just to ask lots of questions now of course when it comes to editing i am making some some decision on things um but the main point for me was to show you the audience or the main story that comes through uh, Mia's life is that to understand Afghanistan and Afghans, you have to understand they are desperately poor. So their decisions are made on the basis of poverty, really quite extreme poverty. You'll see in Mia's life. I mean, it's, it's, it's there. He's having adventures. He's having fun. But the whole day of that family living in that cave was all about getting water from a stream in a container. They had to get the container from somewhere. Finding some firewood or something that would burn, very difficult. And then making a fire to boil water so they could have tea. And then bread. And you later see how they've managed to get some grain. They've managed to get a very rocky slope, which nobody else wants. So they have to plough that, get rid of the rocks, plant the grain. Afghanistan is subject to climate change like anywhere else, so you have to hope the grain grows. If the grain grows, the wheat, they then take it to the water mill. The miller takes 10%, they get the rest. That's just for flour. So basically their staple diet, as you see in the film, is tea and bread. If you understand that Afghans are really poor, you start to understand how and why they make decisions. And the Western forces that went into Afghanistan were misled were played um, they made some terrible mistakes because they didn't realize that afghans if you say to an, a very impoverished family we'll pay you for information well you're going to get information even if it's not correct and all of a sudden that family's rivals who may live a few miles away they're being called taliban because one they're going to get paid for that information and two their rivals are going to get taken away to jail even if they have nothing to do with the taliban um so as a filmmaker, you have to go in being very open minded, talk to a lot of people, always understand that the kinds of things that people are saying to you, you know, don't you can't take anything for granted. Um, and then gradually you piece things together and you just talk to a lot of people and you spend a lot of time and you do a lot of research. I would argue that this is the if you're going to watch one film on Afghanistan to give you an insight into who the Afghans are then this is the film. I don't think there's been a film which really gets to the heart of an Afghan family in this way. But another of your remarkable projects uh, is something completely different. It's the series exhibition on screen. It's done in collaboration with uh, National Gallery in the UK and uh, various television channels. How did you get the idea to make art and history closer to the general public in such a way? So Exhibition on Screen is a, is a, is a cinema brand. We release to the cinemas five films a year based on major exhibitions in galleries or on major artists. Sometimes we just choose an artist that we want to make a film about. So recently we did a film about probably the most popular female artist in history, uh, Frida Kahlo. Um, on the other hand, right now, we're about to make a film based on the biggest exhibition of v Vermeer's works ever. Uh, so we're making a film about Vermeer. And it is, it, it, there is a strange duality in my head. At the one time I'm thinking about Afghanistan, the other time I'm thinking about art. Um, in some ways, there is a connection, which is that what my career over the last 35 years has been about is a, an examination and a celebration of human potential. You know, there's too much on television and in the cinemas of, of the destructive powers of, of us men and women. And I like to, to put my efforts and, into a different area, which is looking at what we are capable of. You know, when you make a film about Leonardo or Raphael or Michelangelo, you are struck by just how, it, how extraordinary it is that us mammals with our 10 digits can create 
the most remarkable art, um, which is still communicates with us now after many hundreds of years. Um, so I've just finished my thirty, you know, the thirty third feature film that we've made for this series, and like you say, we work with all the major galleries around the world. Right now, there are some that are excluded, the Hermitage uh, in St. Petersburg being one, but, you know, we work with many. And once they've shown in the cinemas, and, and before COVID, we were in 65 countries, now it's rather fewer, um, then we release them to television. And they are very popular, either as a 90-minute or as the 50-minute version. But, but were you surprised when the interest of the general public uh, skyrocketed? Did this additional knowledge of the historical concept and the biography, the life of authors, uh, bring the additional audience engagement? I, I, I mean, I've had this argument with television commissioning editors for many years because they will say to me, nobody's interested in art. And I'll say, one, you're wrong. Go to a gallery and it's full of youngsters, old people, all races, I mean, everything. And two, you can create an audience. Um, my children did not want to go to a restaurant where they served raw fish, i.e. a Japanese restaurant serving sushi. They thought that would sounded awful. Now it's one of their favorites. I mean, you take them, you give somebody an experience, and then they might find they really like it. I find it very hard to understand why anyone wouldn't want to explore the life story. I mean, the biographies of these artists are extraordinary. The life story of Leonardo is quite remarkable. Some say, I mean, he's one of the most remarkable human beings to have ever lived. How can you not be interested? Um, if you look at just his artworks, uh, I mean, they're a remarkable achievement and they have so much storytelling to them, the Impressionists. So, you know, in Western Europe, the Impressionists are, remain the most popular genre of artists. Monet, Renoir, Degas, these people. They are remarkable human beings with remarkable stories, with remarkable art. And the reason their art is so remarkable is it still communicates to us now about the feelings that we all share about love and death and ambition and family and so on and so forth. Um, but what was the role of digitalization? How did it help you out uh, with this project? Well, the last 20 years has been staggering in the history of mankind for what digital technology has done. I mean, look at what we're doing now. I'm sitting in my, ho you know, actually in my home office in Brighton. And we and, and you're in Sarajevo and Bosnia and Herzegovina and we're talking over a, a laptop via Zoom. Um, remarkable. You know, this simply didn't exist 20 years ago. As an aside, those that say Afghanistan has gone back to how it was 20, 25 years ago are wrong. And I'll give you one example which is connected to this. When I first went to Afghanistan in 2002, nobody had a mobile phone. Now everybody has mobile phones, including the Taliban. Um, that changes a society. You know, the cat is out of the bag, as we say in Afghanistan. And, you know, it, it, in some ways it creates unhappiness because people can now go onto their mobile phone and see all the, uh, the freedoms that other people have, particularly women who are being extremely badly treated in Afghanistan right now. Um, for me, as far as technology was concerned, I've already mentioned cameras. There was, uh, I mean, cinema technology now doesn't need to get any better. We used to have to distribute on physical film. Now we can send a hard drive and the quality is extraordinary. It really is ultra HD. Doesn't need to improve anymore, in my opinion. Um, we've even done some distribution sometimes uh, on via satellite. So this is how live broadcasts work. Also very popular in this area which is known as event cinema, um, are live opera, live theatre. So somebody can be filming in London via a network of five satellites anywhere in the world. You could be in a cinema in Sarajevo. You could be in Auckland in New Zealand. It doesn't matter. You can watch it live. That's quite remarkable too. Um, I mean, the technology is... is I mean, I, I almost, I'm afraid of, how, of where we're going next because it's just changed so much in the last 20 years. 
The key, of course, is to use it for human good, use it for positive reasons. Um, exactly. That, that's what I wanted to ask you. You have quite an offbeat and unconventional career. What is the essence? We, we've talked about technology, but what is the essence of filmmaking for you? The essence of, of documentary filmmaking is being genuinely curious, just like you, and thinking, you know, every day you have to ask questions of people. You can only do that because you are genuinely interested in in the world and in people and in, you know. So you have to have a genuine curiosity, which I do. Secondly, and again, I'm sure you share this, you have to be ready to work extraordinarily hard. It, 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 it has it, There has to be no alternative to you. It's not like, you know, in, in, early on in your career, when you have a setback, you don't suddenly think, well, maybe I'll try becoming a professional tennis player or a baker. For me, from the age of 15, 16, nothing was going to stop me making films. And there are hurdles along the way. Funding is always an, a, an obstacle. Um, exactly. How uh, do you finance the documentary? Is the crowdfunding one of the options? Because, you know, iconic filmmakers such as Spike Lee and Zach Braff, they use crowdfunds uh, to great ex effect. Yes. We tried, actually, uh, along the way with the film about Mir in Afghanistan, and it wasn't a success for us. Um, Ultimately, we are like the famous little mouse running around that wheel. We just run really, really quickly. And every little bit of money that comes in just goes into the production pot. So it's not a method uh, that I would necessarily recommend. But basically, we, we end up self-funding a lot of our work. We do get bits and pieces. Um, Britain is not the best country for for helping its filmmakers. And of course, now that we've left Europe, we can't access European funding anymore. So actually, I have to say that funding is very, very difficult. So I have to say, with, with this film, My Childhood, My Country, it has been seen on television stations around the world. Um, and for those of, of, of your audience who haven't seen it, you can see it on our... There's a, there's a shortened version on Al Jazeera and there's a long version on our website, um, 7th hyphen art.com the one territory that hasn't bought it and screened it and the, in some senses the most important territory to have it screened is the united states and i think that this is part of the problem with a country like the united states is that they will make hugely important decisions without enough information and so they you know, there's soldiers and sailors and airmen going into, air women, going into Afghanistan, had no idea where they were going, didn't know who they were dealing with. Uh, and it's not just them. It's probably true of British soldiers and Australians and so on and so forth. But you'd think after spending perhaps two trillion dollars, huge amount of casualties and long term physical and psychological damage to it will cost billions to, to care for in the years, the years ahead. You'd think that an American channel would want to show a film uh, which is not particularly, it's not setting out to be critical of everything, all things American. Um, at the beginning of the film, Mir, Mir says, and which was the common belief in 2002, 2003, we like the Americans, they brought us peace. What happened? What wasn't achieved? What went wrong? What was achieved? Um, and so that's a real frustration to me. Now, maybe now that it's getting some cinema attention and it's won some awards, the BAFTA and other awards, um, maybe we'll finally get it on. After we had our American cinemas, we'll get it onto American television. This is where I have to give credit to Al Jazeera. In the United Kingdom, I know, I mean, it, it's becoming increasingly common that my friends say, we watch Al Jazeera to get our world, our, our international news. Um, and, you know, if you go to the United States and you want to really get a sense of international use, you won't. You can't find it. It's it, And that makes them isolationist. It makes them uninformed. I'm not saying it's only the United States where people are like that, but it's particularly noticeable, I think. You talked about the impact of the film. Uh, what is the impact of the film and are we over-exaggerating it? I wonder this myself when I when I look around me and I see what's happening in the world and I wonder what has been the impact of all these films that we've made. 
I was at the excellent uh, Al Jazeera um, Balkans um, documentary festival last week. As you mentioned, I was on the jury, saw 12 very good films. Um, but you wonder, you know, do these films actually have any impact? Because there are still, you know, these oligarchs who are stealing tens of millions. There are still these kids who are lack parental love. I think ultimately we we do have an impact and it is positive. But actually, I think that this film, this particular film, um, you know, in the United Kingdom, when it was shown, it was shown on our most commercial channel. It was watched by a million people and a million people will now have a greater sense of who the Afghans are, their humanity, their humor, their optimism, their struggles, their poverty. Um, they will uh, be aware that Mia's wife, for example, is very articulate and, and, you know, very, you know, no longer do you have this image of all Afghans are covered in burqas and don't speak, Afghan women. Mia, there's no way that you can think all Afghans are terrorists when you've dealt with Mia, who's as far from a terrorist as you can imagine. You'll also get a sense of what a beautiful country it is. And I guess we have to have a degree of optimism that, um, I mean, I think I, I have a degree of optimism because I, I see the youth, my kids, 18, 19, 20, 21, yes. who have far more awareness of gender issues, of uh, environmental issues, of racial issues than, than we ever did. So that has to be positive. And part of that has come from the films that they've mm -hmm. seen on television and in the cinema. Phil, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera Balkans. My great pleasure.